We are here doing the Dragonfly Earth Medicine uh, panel. These are breeders. Uh, I kind of announced earlier, but I'll kind of go over it again. We've got Jesse Biovortex. He's also a producer of a movie that's coming out called Tending the Garden. Um, he's also an incredible breeder. He's been working things. He does a lot of breeding on the coast. So if you are looking for that mold resistant stuff, this is the man. He's been doing some amazing stuff. I've been working with his genetics for years and I can't talk highly enough about them. Uh, we got Forrest from Sunroots, uh, Covalo, you know, we all know Covalo, big plants, big plants, if you guys want big plants, these are the people that work on that, so. But you have to grow them in Covalo, in the water. <laughs> I think it does help, uh, but I couldn't. And then we got Zelig from Spring Creek. You gotta check out what he does. I mean, the man obviously works really, really hard and, and uh, you know, much respect to just the, the tenacity and the pursuit of, of farming and challenging mountain hillsides and stuff and, and working with it, so, yeah. And then Daniel from Heart Rock Mountain. You know, Daniel's, Daniel's the family guy that you want to bring your kids to hang out with because, and, and, and so he's a true breeder. Um, he, he's good at making kids and he's good at making seeds and he, he makes a lot of them so you know people that want the auto flower or some CBD this guy's got kind of the range uh, look look into it and then we got Moongazer we got Josh over here uh, you know I met Josh a, a long time ago at this point which is kind of a trip because it doesn't it's just like time has gotten weird but um, it's been really cool watching somebody like they, you guys came to our farm like, way back in the day before you had a farm and before you started yours. And so, you know, I got to kind of watch that process unfold via Instagram mostly, but also I've been able to visit that farm and it's been just magical. They've got twins, you know, uh, we all, you know, the whole kid thing changes your world. So, um, but yeah, so yeah, that's who's up here. Um, I do have a piece of paper, and I was trying to be somewhat organized. I like to look like I am. But basically what I'm going to do is just kind of bring up some topics in, in relation to breeding and genetics and let these people uh, kind of share with you their thoughts on what I'm asking. So, um, prepare. Uh, Dem here, so I just got a shout out to Josh and Kelly, you know, they, they really have spearheaded a large uh, network of community that has really, you know, they're really doing good stuff, like, they're up in Canada, kind of stuck there, uh, and, and, and that's so good, you know, because they get to really work on their space, and, um, but they bring, bring a lot of inspiration, and so this is a Dem Pier panel, and we're all a part of that family and um, we've all been sharing genetics and working with genetics uh, for, for some time now. So thank, uh, thanks uh, everybody who put this on, you know, Tamara and Joey, um, making this kind of thing happen. To me this is like, this is like the true future of all this. It's like going back in time, you know, it's like, let's make this happen like it once did, again regardless um, and I feel like it's a timeless act so you know we gather we share seeds we work we, we get to be around the people who have put a lot of time and energy into their seeds and 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 that needs to keep happening in our in our planet in order for us to really fully awaken into uh, this next coming age uh, which is an age of golden light and you know that age of golden light and consciousness is real so you know, I just want people to, I've been trying to give people, as many people, some of that weed that I, I grew just to smoke during a, the time while we're all listening so we can receive that energy. Um, and so let's get, let's get into it. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to let each one of the breeders here just kind of talk about themselves a little bit. Um, and I want you to just kind of introduce yourself. 
but I want I want to know your relationship to the breeding and to genetics and and what inspires you and what has inspired you in in that realm um, and where it kind of started and and I know it can get long-winded so let's just keep track of time but just try to pick out some nuggets of things that have really helped guide you further into the process so let's start maybe on one end and work down the line just for easy sake so Jesse what's the inspiration come up or do you move yeah. over the microphone let's do that oh wow <laughs> Stand and deliver. <laughs> Can we hear it for Nick? That was freaking amazing. Like, <laughs> it's real shit. Mixed a little stand up comedy and, like, brought everyone in and all of the seeds. And those seeds will do a lot of stuff. It makes me think of the original uh, Living Soil Symposium and the seeds that went out there and, like, seeing that stuff today still in all the different ways that it's been worked on so I, don't know, I think it's real beautiful the, the sharing of seeds and the way that we it brings us together and we get to like exchange a relation around a relationship with nature ob observing a plant and I think um, from the moment I first like found cannabis seeds and weed like I was immediately fascinated immediately grew them brought them out in the woods fascinated about the plant in every way and then that fasc made me fascinated about nature in every way and science and art and mutualistic relationships all the ways that those work and how those actually can apply to everything in nature but also everything in our own constructs and that's the way we should be working for economy and for the way that we interact in business and in friends and events like this I think are an amazing example of that potential so yeah, hear it. let's hear it for this event. Thank you guys. Really special. Because this is what it was and it's, yeah, it feels good. The weather blessed us. Um, yeah, it just, this is the type of exchange, this is the type of thing we've been hungry for and very much the last two years for sure. But honestly, before those two years, it already kind of got fucked and we didn't even have shit like this before COVID. So I don't know, it's, a, it's definitely a very cathartic feeling to just be here and um, experience all this with you and celebrate the plants and friendship and community. Um, I started a project called BioVortex a while ago um, around the idea of uh, influencing cannabis industry in a more environmentally thoughtful direction and mutualism in general in the way that we interact with each other. And the breeding has been part of that, but so has the um, social media as the photography, the art projects, the movie projects that we're doing now, all kinds of different aspects. And then the talks and events, the Regenerative Cannabis Farm Award at the Emerald Cup and being able to have an award ceremony also talk about the practices and the farms and getting to know the farms in that level and being able to do the Rage Lounge and do all the different talks that got to connect cannabis community to the practices that mattered. And that also built this kind of amazing family like everyone you know, right here, just very special people. And we've got to like grow each other's genetics, visit each other's gardens, share in each other's families and food and, and watch each other's children grow up. And it's, yeah, <laughs> special stuff, you know? Um, and yeah, I, I'll, I'll <laughs> let it go to the next person, but I'm very thankful for this moment and all of you. I'm Forrest uh, from Sunroots Farm up in Covalo, and uh, everything what Jesse just said, like bringing us all together, really feels like the right thing to do right now. You know, it's like we need this more than ever to be able to come and just show each other what we're doing, what we still love to do, and it just feels like a good thing to be doing. Um, like. I started growing when I was in a, a young age and I always was drawn to, you know, the color and the weed and like the connection to farming and, you know, just being out in the garden. And it's really been like a journey through life, just doing what I love and like sharing each step and, you know, just keep, you know, expanding like the awareness of 
of uh, you know good conscious gardening and uh, bringing the skills to the table to, to show people and uh, I like to grow big plants obviously you guys have probably heard um, <laughs> we do a lot of our own genetics uh, we've done our own genetics uh, for a long time my family has been breeding my brother uh, crossed the jaw goo and we've just been kind of going off uh, you know the goo line really and uh, you know breeding this and that into it and it's really been uh, a pretty awesome thing to be doing and it, it feels good so it's, thank you for being let us letting us be up here and uh, showing you what what we do best at Yo, what's up, everybody? Nice to see you all. I'm Zelig, Spring Creek Farm, um, Sonoma County, Casadero. We've been uh, doing uh, no-till light depth for, you know, 18, 19, 20 years for, or so before we knew what we were really doing. So, uh, you know, it's really nice to, uh, you know, be here with everybody and, you know, experience, you know, this seed swap and, you know, I'm just really thankful to, you know, know you all and, and just, you know, just smoke weed. I'm, I just smoked a bunch of hash, so I'm fucking baked and so, yeah, hitting the old hash pipe. But yeah, no, this is what we all really need, you know, and for, you know, we all know what's going on in the industry and... You know, it, it is what it is. The plant is kind of uh, in control of this whole paradigm, you know. It's not about money or anything. It's really just about the plant, you know. And, and so it's it, there's a lot going on. And, you know, I, I think that as long as we, you know, obviously it's bringing us together as much as, you know, I think we can all say that maybe we feel a little bit detached, you know, honestly, because I know I do. Um, I am right here with everybody, you know, but at the same time, I feel, I don't know if it was just me, but I feel like there's this detachment going on. And so by all of us coming together, it's really crucial, you know, especially right now, because I know we're all feeling it. I know I'm feeling it and know everybody else is feeling it. So just really thankful that we're all showing up for each other, um, you know. You know, just like you're all a bunch, like some of my favorite people in the world right here, you know, I just love y'all and just uh, been doing my thing up on the hill. Y'all probably see me doing what I do. I, you know, I just do what I do, make no claims. I come from no educational background. I'm just a practical guy who, you know, just listens to the plants and do what I'm told. They just tell me what to do. I just do what they want me to do. That's all I need to know. It doesn't matter if... It doesn't matter what, what you think, and that's kind of the whole part of my whole methodology is just the trust, you know, um, just trusting the plant, trusting the process, you know, kind of like an onion. You're just peeling back the layers. The more you peel back the layers, the more you trust it, and the more, the more is revealed over time. So I think that's just the, you know, because like there's a lot of, you know, there's like the the bro science, there are people like the science world, it's like, oh, if you don't test stuff, you're a bro science, you know, like, you know what I mean, Nick? Like, if you don't test something, you're, you're automatically, you know, like, you don't know what's going on. Like, you don't need to know, because if you're following the methodology, methodology of nature, nature's taking care of everything, because nature is the most intelligent system on Earth. So, we don't really need to know. You know, I think it's good to know so you have that relationship with your soil, but once you get that base of your understanding and relationship with your soil, then, you know, uh, you can kind of just go from there and, you know, I don't know, it's just, uh, I don't know, it's just something I've been thinking about a lot, you know, just, it's just like this, you know, within the industry, how, you know, people are, if you know, just the different sides of the coin, of the science side to, you know, like me and Nick are just like on our own little world, you know. And like, you know, a bunch of other, you know, farmers, we just kind of like do our thing and listen to the plants, do what we're told, you know, but, you know, then there's the, the, the side of the coin where you have to test everything and it's all like that. And, you know, I think it's, and ultimately everybody's just looking for that balance, you know, so I think it's just, 
what we're looking for. Everybody's looking for balance, whatever it is, whatever you're trying to do. I think we're just all looking for the same thing, which is balance. So, I don't know. Yeah, I've been doing my breeding project, which is just like, I'm just breeding for like this head change that I am experiencing, um, which was this uh, dog shit seeds, bag seed that I started, uh, and just kind of a long story, I won't get into it all. But yeah, I've just been kind of, which turned out to be I was breeding for a high CBGA and didn't know it until I started testing. And then went back and went through all of my previous tests and I found they were all high in CBGA and so I've realized that's what I was breeding for. So that's kind of like my breeding project is like a high CBGA breeding project, um, which is the precursor to all cannabinoids. So, you know, it's kind of significant. Um, so that's something that's cool that I've been working on, but yeah, just super thankful to be here. Um, yeah, I don't know. Just love y'all. Give thanks. Okay. Um, I'm Daniel with uh, Heart Rock Mountain Farm, uh, Pride Line Seeds, and I think kind of what like Jesse was saying, uh, cannabis was my gateway plant. Um, it was the first plant I grew. Uh, and uh, my older brother isn't here to confirm anymore, but he had like house plants in like middle school, but he could have been growing weed then too, probably. But yeah, I started out growing cannabis and now I have, you know, cactuses in my greenhouse. You know, I'm like taking cuttings from people's houses of their house plants and I I'm obsessed with plants. And uh, so I'm thankful for that and for this community. And um, I'm second generation uh, cannabis breeder, third if you count my Nana, who, was, who grew in Old Topanga for a long time. I even went down to help her harvest once in high school. She's like, can you help me out? I'm like, sure, I'll come down, Nana. It'll be a fun trip to LA. She had like a plant up her second story window. I'm like, okay, I see why, yeah, I'll get, I'll get it, yeah. Uh, and you know, my, one of my favorite stories from my dad, he was saving bag seed for like a decade, you know, before he popped his first seeds in 76. And it was like, you know, Mexican, South American. Uh, they acclimated that to the hills in Northern California. Um, and then some indica came in from Afghanistan. They grew that, they crossed those together, grew them for decades. And, and then I came onto the scene. My older brother, a lot younger, I think he was like 10 or 11, helping my dad in the garden. And he looked at me and said, you know, you need to go to school. I got one kid growing weed. Was, do something else with your life. And now I'm running the family farm and he's pretty happy. I mean, he wanted me to be more than just an outlaw, which I get. And now I'm more than just an outlaw. I run a commercial cannabis farm and licensed nursery. Yeah, it's, and then uh, we just, you know, we just, we, we've always made seeds. And like, um, I've talked with Nick and like Zelig was saying, like we learned the heart first. We were, we're plant whispers first. And now we're like, okay, what does filial mean? I better look that up from Webster's. Okay, like, you know, so we're learning the science. Um, where we need to and it's it's fun and we're all very passionate about what we do and it's great to be up here with these guys hey I'm Josh from Moongazer Farms uh, just got to give a huge love and gratitude to Joey and Tamara this is amazing you guys are amazing uh, this is like how things used to be and I'm getting a lot of good feeling from how that all was and thank you all for coming um, but basically pretty much uh, uh, my wife Sandra and I uh, we have a couple kids twins and we're just trying to make it as a legal uh, as a you know rec farm um, back when we met Nick and, and Jesse and everyone things were starting to get legal and we kind of jumped into it and uh, People were telling us to grow clones and have everything be all uniform and everything and we just always wanted to stick with the seeds and um, do our breeding and it's uh, finally gotten you know it's gotten us to a point now where it's like you just got to have like triple-a herb right now and it's got to you know it's like it's got to be good <laughs> and and growing from seeds you know we were able to achieve that even though we have different phenotypes and you know things don't have to be like super duper uniform all the time um so it's you know yeah so you know seeds like just for so many reasons i mean i mean even our own kids like they're you know we had 
they're different phenotypes, but people think they're identical. People think they're identical all the time. Uh, but we see their subtle differences, and we love their subtle differences. Um, and so that's sort of how I approach the cannabis, um, and how a lot of us here approach the cannabis. Um, and 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 it's just kind of been, if if you want a truly sun-grown product, uh, which we do, that's what we like to smoke. Uh, it's sort of planted in the spring, on the when the moon is a specific when the moon is in a certain uh, phase and. We harvest it in the fall um, when the moon's in a certain phase, and uh, you know when you're growing from clones. Clones are wonderful, and they've been crucial for this plant, of course, uh, in its evolution. But at this point, for us, when we're when we're out in the light and we're doing it out, we're doing it this way. Um, you know, that's that's how we want to smoke. That's what we want to provide for people, and so that's how we're doing it. Is just from seed planted in the spring, harvested in the fall, and. Of course, planted among lots of other beautiful plants so that we don't have to spray anything. And that's what we do. Hello, okay. Hello, hello, okay. I think this just got a loose uh, thing, so we got to be careful when we're holding it. But I just would rather sit down and kind of not do the whole thing in that way. Um, and then I'll just pass this around. But I'm just going to kind of bring up some topics. Uh, Okay, we're back on. All right. Uh, so, I want to I want to get into some um, just kind of I want to dig into some breeding a little bit. Uh, I'm pretty passionate about it. You know, my evolution with breeding seeds has evolved rapidly, and 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 I haven't been doing it as long as everybody. Uh, but I've been committed to it uh, very pretty seriously and been paying really close attention to a whole bunch of different lines and, and working lines. But my question is, uh, out, of, out of all the seeds that you like to grow, and if we could think of seeds in different categories, such as the uh, F1, IBL, polyhybrid, um, specific traits within genetics that you might like, uh, but what type of seeds are your preference for growing for you? Not, not for what the market wants, because if we're all, all breeders have to do a certain amount of work uh, for the market, but also then there's a certain amount of soul work that goes on in breeding. And so I want to pull some of the soul out of you guys and just like, hear what your favorite types of seeds to pop right now are and interpret that the way you will if it's from your own stock if it's just whatever but uh, if anybody wants to volunteer to take that one on first let's go down the line, go down the line again it's nice and easy with the mic Push it on the bottom. Now try. We good? Alright. <laughs> Seems a little sensitive down there. I guess what I most want to grow is what I find interesting. And that's a little bit rough. Um yeah, it's what what I get to learn from what things that I find interesting, that's that's what I want to keep sprouting, the things that I have in my head, what I wanna see what I want to see other people grow and what I want to see come from that. It's all the like very interesting like possibilities that, that go out and you know what what else will come from 
this seed. Um, if you turn your body a little bit, you won't forget the, there won't be a feed up. You won't be back in this way. Block your back to the Yeah, the, the speaker's right here, so that actually works a better. Huh? Um, so to be able to see the outcome of something on a farm too in different locations also really interests me and doing that around hash is really interesting to be able to see how hash comes out how that yields and to see that on different farms and different plants isolated and then the idea of breeding with them but some of the like really joyful things are, are growing like true primordial varieties and land races and seeing all the lessons that they like kind of have in there and really observing the plant in those forms. The low lab um, from uh, Irazin Indian Land Rice Seed Exchange, he had, he had got these low lab valley uh, seeds, which is like 7,000 feet up in um, Kashmir and in an area growing in the trees and in the hills where it didn't have any other cross pollination. There's no light pollution, so it's not really affected by human encroachment and it actually is a primordial variety that's just been growing in the trees and it was really interesting to see all the things that were already there in this thing this plant that's been growing in the same way for thousands of years in the same location without other things messing with it and it was very they were yeah very adaptive very smart they're kind of like wolves of the wolves of uh, a cannabis plant in the fact that they're like just adapted to survive in this place and not domesticated. When we start to do domestication process, like instant morphology changes happen. So like if you're picking your favorite plant and smelling those flowers and then, or seeing how well it hashes or something, those seeds are the ones that are actually inside the, the flower and just hidden in that bracts a little closer to the, the actual stem and inside. And so, those ones, they don't like fly out that easy and they get bigger and instantly you start domesticating the seeds get plumper and bigger. These seeds are incredibly small and very thin and ready to like fly out. So like when breeding with it, like it had to be really careful to like put a bag around it before cutting it because the seeds would all just start flying, you know? And, and that's like a scattering too. The wind would come by and they would actually go pretty far. It was just like ready to shoot out. And it's like, oh yeah, you know, like the only reason why they'd stay in is because that was like an interaction with humans and like picking the thing that you so those are the ones that keep getting passed on it's like the one in your favorite flower if you're, you're actually choosing that kind of selection process it's it just kind of interesting to think about all the lessons something old can show us and the adaptive aspect of it too as far as being able to watch it in, interact with the sun and its environment or them. I don't want to say it. It's not like the right word when referring to a plant. But um, you know, they. I was growing both male and females, and we we should have better words, I guess. But they were they were tracking the sun so perfectly before it rose. You know, like and I actually did night vision uh, uh, time lapse photos of them to watch this dance that they do each day, and they would just like set up so good, like just stretching like straight yoga ready for the sun and got every bit of that perfect like light in the beginning and then would kind of track and then at night they would fold down so far just completely like hold everything in and go through this whole breath um and yeah it was just interesting like how fast they grew and how small and slow they grew at first too all the seeds were um they're just so small and they take so long to germinate and, and are, are difficult to germinate. And I was thinking about, well, that makes a ton of sense because if all of a sudden they're scattering and then the snow comes down or like it, it rains right before the winter, every plant that germinates just dies 7,000 feet up or so. And so they had to really be smart enough to know, hey, are these conditions really right? You know, like, okay, yeah, it's wet. Maybe it's warm enough, but is it warm enough for enough period of time for us to really be like okay cool let's crack we're gonna we're gonna have a successful season and not immediately die by like some big storm and uh yeah then they seem to like show that too they're very careful they're just like okay is this it and they 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 crack so slowly the germination and just that root radical is just so small and coming out the teeniest little 
sprouts, but then they grow really, really fast um, and take, take advantage of whatever they have. And that might be, um, but if they don't have much, they'll conserve too. So they, they can kind of, they're very adaptive in figuring that kind of stuff out. But um, yeah, the things that are, are, are fascinating or interesting that connect to something old and get me thinking, and whether that's for making something that makes a farmer more successful in what they're doing. You know, I like mold resistance. I like having stuff that flowers at certain times, certain terpene profiles, certain hash yielding just profiles in the flowers and look at all the things and like figuring out what works for someone. And that's a constant puzzle and fascination too. So the things that are interesting. So I want to thank Jesse because he shared his genetics with me and um, have just made new genetics now that are like substantially better mold resistance and, you know, crystal content because um, he has a lot of hash strains. Um, so I bred that with a lot of my different velvet perps crosses. Um, so now they're like, they seem supercharged, but uh, I started growing like little plants in the bushes, like gorilla status, you know. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have done that before, but uh, I was always uh, fascinated with like, you know, throwing pollen on. I would have to like walk two miles and I had a couple little male plants in a, in a little, cre uh, little spring bed, you know, and I would take the pollen and throw it on my best, my, you know, one of my best plants. And, you know, just to see the d diversity of what comes out of, you know, just throwing a little bit of pollen on and uh, seeing, you know, the different phenotypes that come out. It's just, it's kind of like a Pandora's box. You never know what you're gonna get. So that really like, you know, got me into breeding, you know. So about 10 years ago, I really started to, do it each year making my own seeds and then growing them and then selecting the best ones you know that I liked and throwing more pollen on them um, and it's you know it's just like a it's a good thing to do you know yeah it, it really yeah. it makes me happy yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know yeah keep on doing it yeah uh, now it's like that everything's changed into you know like you have to have the best stuff to even just get it on the market to maybe sell it for a decent price possibly i don't know not not anymore maybe hopefully in the future you know but uh you know we can just keep crossing our varieties together and who knows what we'll come up with so I'm going to jump in because I'm right here in line. I just want to share what I'm working on as well or what is exciting right now. Um, but when I think of breeding seeds, I mean, that's the piece that I'm most excited about, which is funny because it's not, doesn't mix as well as a, com a commercial production farmer, which I have to rely on. Um, but I love breeding so much that I just do it. And my favorite thing lately has been doing as many inbred lines as I can, as many populations of those inbred lines as I can in small rows within a greenhouse high population counts and making selections within those inbred lines and furthering each inbred line, but also they're all there set up stacked on one another to make real F1s if all of the lines that you're putting in your breeding hoop are inbred. So you're making more IBLs and you're making more F1 stock. And F1 stock is what you wanna have if you're growing production, which I have to do and I have to depend on that, so I've had to go through that testing process. But the truth is there aren't really real F1s out there right now because we're all still so immature in our breeding. Uh, you know, uh, there are some, you know, deeper F, we're getting further, but really uh, standard inbreeding for isolating traits and characteristics is like more than 10 generations. So, you know, when that's the case, we just have to be realistic. But 
I just say keep going down the lines, keep inbreeding, but also keep crossing those inbred lines to make those F1s and explore that because the hybrid vigor is definitely something to understand when you're growing for production. So the breeding is the most exciting thing for me and I just go kind of a little overboard with uh, inbred line collections, but. Yeah. What, what Nick just said. Yeah, what he just said. Basically, well said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, um, there's a bunch of things in there, like what you're saying, how it's it's hard to do that in, in a commercial space that you're trying to run for production, and that's what I've been doing for years, is breeding and doing production, so running a research facility and a production facility in one space, which is really crazy, because you, there's a lot of room for... I mean, there's no room for error, you know? Uh, you, so you really have to be like extra on your shit. You cannot slack for one second because you just, you're working with a lot of different lines. So, plus it's just, you know, uh, e e yeah, it's just hard to really, you know, pop enough seeds and, and, and have the square footage to make those selections. So I'm kind of actually kind of phased out of um, doing my breeding projects for right now and just holding on to my seed stock just because it's it's I'm trying to just stay you know we you know shit's kind of falling apart right so I'm just trying to stay in my lane and that's that's okay you know so I'm not trying to do too much which is you know it's okay you know I've been so yeah I was running these uh, inbred lines I've been running this these dogs I'm calling it the dog pound which, uh, you know, from my uh, dog, uh, my, my dog originally was like dog shit, bag seed, and then um, this um, uh, super silver haze uh, male. Um, so, you know, we just started running a bunch of lines off of that dog shit. So I really like the dog shit terps. I just literally, I just love it. I don't, a lot, it, it, it was a hard sell because of the name, you know, obviously. So, you know, but, so that's, you know, so then that that's how kind of the dog star came up once it went into the super silver. You know, we, we, we called it dog star, you know, which was, you know, um, like, like Sirius A, you know, the origins of cannabis, um, that whole story. I'm not going to get into all that, but. You know, that's kind of like, you know, paying homage to to the origins of cannabis and that whole thing. And the fact that, you know, kind of, you know, it, the, that we ended up finding uh, the high CBGA, which is the precursor to all cannabinoids, you know, it, that was pretty appropriate for, you know, calling it Dog Star, I felt, you know, to, you know, because it was it was something special, like, you know, over 3% um, CBGA at full turn, like, like full term harp you know full term three months later testing it it's over th three percent three four percent cbj which was you know which is one of the first uh cannabinoids that you know deteriorates you know and and so or it's really hard to get high you know to isolate the cbj apparently which i didn't know at the time so you know once we found that out um, we just started uh working with that a little more intentionally you know and that was kind of like that was that head change that I was chasing, kind of like a CBD, you know, we all know what that's like, you know, but the CBGA, it's kind of, it's similar, but it's got like that different head change, but it's similar, you know, and, and it's really hard to put your finger on, you know what I mean, because, uh, you know, it just is, so, um, that's, you know, so that was really exciting for me, because that's what I was doing, and that's kind of like my story, so that was really exciting. As far as what I would like to work with, I'd like to work with everyone else's stuff, but I, I don't quite have like the space to, to pop everybody's and label it all and, 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 you know, but I would love to. So I really, you know, and if somebody's going to give me something to work with, I kind of need like a hundred of, of any one, you know, a, a, you know, seed to just to pop because like 10 is just like, what am I doing with that? You know, I'm like, where, what, I, I don't have, you know, I'm going to start looking for other, you know, headset, you know, just... You know, I'm trying to, you know, on a commercial facility, you have to have more of a direction, so. But we just don't have the, my county, whatever, so we, we're just uh, we're just staying in our lane for right now. Um, you know, which is cool. So anyway, that's been, uh, it's been good, but, you know, I'll get back into uh, messing with uh, popping a bunch of seeds and looking for different lines, and, you know, I'll get back into that any minute now, but. 
for right now, I've just been trying to like, you know, um, hold the line, you know, just survive for a minute. But um, yeah, yeah, I just like to, I would love to work with like everyone's stuff, really. But yeah, kind of like what Nick is saying, it's just like, that's what I've been, run, you know, just doing that for a long time. And so yeah, I just, uh, yeah, it work, it's working out. Just gotta listen to the plant. You know, we were just, we were just, you know, we weren't, we didn't have any like, you know, education in this or guidance. We were just literally, just like, you know, like we do everything, just listening, just being guided by the plant. And it's amazing how far that can get you. You know, it's amazing. That's really just what it is. Our ancestors did that. That's just how it is. You know, it, it's really effective. It got us all this far. Look at all the amazing genetics and lines and breeder, breeding, you know, that's that's happened throughout, you know, like a long, many, many years. So, yeah, it's just, uh, it's really good that we're all here swapping seeds and, you know, I think it's awesome. It's really cool how everybody's like let, not holding on to shit anymore like it used to be like this, like, whole lockdown, you know. And that's kind of also why I just was like doing my own thing, you know, just because we were just doing our own thing. We weren't like messing with anyone else's stuff, really. So, yeah, it's just been it now. So it's really nice that to have all this variety, because that's you know that's just like this, that's what life is about, variety. All right, cool. Um, I'll keep this short. Uh, what Nick said? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, just working lines is definitely what I'm into, too, and, um, you know, you kind of, you kind of see what you want to look for in your, your first generation, and then you get to see what you're working with in your second generation, and, you know, so, uh, it, and it is, like, I'm sure everyone up here will agree, like, it's about getting lucky, too, you know, it's like, sometimes, you just, but then, if you had, like, the population to do the sifts, like, if you start enough seeds of uh you know f1 f2 f3 you're gonna find one that looks just like her mother and if that's the one you made the seeds on that you know that's the one you want to stabilize and, and sometimes you get lucky and find her and you know 40 seeds or less you know sometimes you don't you got to look again the next generation or there's been a lot of times where i make a generation of seeds get the pot i'm like oh i'm not gonna make it this year this isn't you know i didn't find what i was looking for but you know it's fun and you're gonna lose things and you're gonna find things and it, it is uh, beautiful working with this plant this plant spirit you know the the you know cannabis is I mean everything's consciousness right you know the, or light or vibrate whatever you want to look at on the molecular level and, and something like cannabis or the cactus or some other uh, plants that interact with our consciousness they have a higher concentration of that and we get to co-create with that and we get to find whatever you know you, any one of us could take a line and go a different direction with it when we put our heart into it and that's a beautiful thing too and it is beautiful to share uh, those genetics with everybody and 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 to not worry like worry about giving it out there because you're gonna do something beautiful with it and we might go somewhere else with it and then we get something back from somebody or lose something and you yeah, that co-creation with this plant and uh, and yeah we really need that right now uh, as a planet and a people what cannabis can do from like oil production to medicine and and just with consciousness in general you know and and i'm also very excited that uh psychedelics are going to be legal soon hopefully in the next like our lifetime across the united states and, um yeah i mean if you listen you know she, she calls to you she talks to you and and then you get to put your input in too, and it's a fun relationship as a breeder that you develop with your plants in your lines, and then your friends' lines. Like you know, like you know, we're all doing like amazing work, or you know, or getting lucky. Uh, yeah, I mean, with regard to what we like to grow, uh, basically when we first started out. Um, you know, definitely Jesse's seeds I had been seeking out. Uh, I was basically looking for seeds that had been grown in living soil and, and out in the full sun that were resistant. And of course that tasted really good and things like that. I mean, since then we've probably, every, everyone on this panel, we've got a little bit of genetics from. We have some from Amanda's garden and Joey and Tamara. We got some seeds from, so um, we just love to mix it up. We love to smoke. And so we like to try lots of different things and from day to day or 
you know, our, our taste or our palate might change. Um, but we definitely will go for commercial uh, as well. So, um, but we're not too fixated on having them all be purple. You know, if, if, if you end up having a little bit of mixed phenotypes, but they all have a certain smell, uh, we're super into like some, you know, uniformity in that sense. Um, but hash also, we're definitely been breeding for and thankful to Jesse for get, getting us some of the Nana Breath and the other Banana OG crosses um, that have been super nice for us. Um, yeah, bananas, coffees, uh, just lots of different guavas, watermelons, blueberries, um, just kind of mixing it all up. It's always been fun. Here. So, um, I'm into hash as well now, by the way. Uh, and so that's another part that I'm super excited in the, I, like I'm, I'm seriously mostly focused on hash line seeds for growing because I really just am like, well, the truth is, is when the resin is stored, I can have something for years that's really like it was. And the flower, you know, it's bulky and big and I don't know, but so there's this beauty in hash that I've really been tuning into. Um, so from a genetic standpoint, that's definitely been something I, I have felt. But I think, you know, things have been rolling for quite a while. How's everybody feeling? Do we want to keep rolling down this path or should we kind of take a break and walk around? And what do you guys think? It's, it's way past the time. I can't, I don't know when we started. I don't know where we're at. Um, keep going. Going. Cool. Um, we can do one more round. Why not? Yeah, let's do another round. We got. It. We don't. Rarely are we all in this kind of scenario together. So, um, let's see. We have. So, when I when I talk to people about what are you going to get from a seed standpoint, um. You know, I like to have some categories of like steering people in the right direction to kind of most help them in their path towards what they're trying to do. So it's like trying to uh, create a whole bunch of stuff. And so there's all these names that people use in our cannabis genetics. And, and, and I just kind of want to address them a little bit and be like, there's a lot of loose meaning to a lot of the language uh, when it comes to F1, F2. Um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not super dialed within, within cannabis breeding or, or it hasn't been as much, but um, I think it's important for us to explore it and to understand it more uh, and to understand like what agriculture normally does in, in the breeding sense. And so uh, I was talking about inbred lines and, and you know, the, the value of breeding within bred lines to create hybrids that really have a lot of vigor and all that, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, the benefits and the and the, the value of polyhybrids as well, because you know there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of polyhybrids around, and and a lot less of the more strict line work has been being done, and you know there's a lot to learn when you go down that path of strict line work, um, and and when you peter out or or just understanding that inbred lines do kind of slowly become uh, less of a productive thing but it should be being more honed. And as you narrow that further, your population should start to become increasing. So you might bottleneck some things a couple generations to try and steer it in the direction you want. But at that, after that point, when you've honed something that you've got, and most of them are showing that, you wanna open the populations back up because you don't wanna keep taking one single parent and one single male and only doing that. You wanna make, start to increase the genetic diversity amongst your bottleneck genetics already. So inbred line work is more than just continually filial generationally crossing, but you also wanna think about some population expansions as you're getting into a, a lesser or more inbred degraded state which are actually really good for breeding and people shouldn't get scared of an inbred line that doesn't produce and grow like uh, a hybrid does. But you don't get them for that. You don't get them for production. You get those inbred lines because you want to work with them from a breeding standpoint because they create a super vigorous F1 uh, 
hybrid offsprings. But let's, I want to go down the line and just let people address polyhybrids and how polyhybrids and working with polyhybrids, what that's like for you. So here we go. Man. Is that working? We good? All right. What? It is. All right. Man, that was excellent information. I hope everyone was actually paying attention to that. Um, yeah, there's a lot to think about with that. So um, I really appreciate Nick's constant work to go down, you know, like multiple, multiple generations, like getting to F6, 7, 8 um, in different varieties. And when you get to that point, it's a certain level of line breeding that breeds over very true as far as genetics go and and the hybrids that come out of that are really amazing and you know when we first met we there was these um it was with ryan from humble seeds and the glazed cherry and he gave you those i gave you the black dog and you took them to like multiple generations and then put them together and those hybrids were so even and so much bigger like you could just see that multiple generation vigor and it's like you know, that's how a lot of breeding's done in agriculture for vegetables and everything. You take stuff to pretty far generation, F8, F9, and then you put them together to make an F1 that is a true vigorous hybrid. And there's actually, strangely enough, a certain uniformity in, in what happens from that crossing of varieties when they're, they're to that point of line breeding. But he also just gave really, ama really good information around not getting bottleneck genetically. So as you you know, you start off early, you're making very solid selections for exactly what you want it to be. You're building that canon of the flavor, the like, the resistance, the structure, all of the factors that you're thinking about and building that. But then you want to make sure that you're using multiple males. And then if you're putting that on to multiple females, and this is from sibling generation, that you then get to really choose from those females, but you know that they've been pollinated with multiple males. And so then as you've already done some work towards that um, selecting what you want and stabilization of that variety, you make sure not to bottleneck it and then you can work that for, for longer. So that's it's really like opening that potential to not get too far down that line. And what happens is actually smaller and smaller plants, a little less vigor, and, but, but more and more, smaller seeds too, yeah, yeah. And, and but more and more, um, similar too though you know and so it's an incredibly useful thing but f1s are amazing too so anyway polyhybrids is actually what the question is about so, or the, what we're supposed to be talking about and i fucking love polyhybrids i love the work of of going down multiple generations i also love back crossing work too which is going back to a generation or the original generation that the, what you like the most of something and it's a way of like kind of stacking the genetics onto each other and you can get to a higher percentage of the same genetic in that next generation really quickly. So that's something I like to do and then I like to combine that with then doing uh, sibling cro uh, generations from that. And so making BC1 F2 or F5 or something in the black dog case and then it becomes a very much just that genetic. It's it, the and very useful for breeding because it's, it's, it's similar to that line breeding of getting to a F8 or something. But during that time with polyhybrids, you get to like do all kinds of things. I, I only line breed like a couple things, you know, each year. You choose a few things that you're going to work pretty good. And then, but then you have the potential to do whatever you want. So I don't really want to limit that. And so it's pretty exciting to be like, oh my God, this would be amazing with that. And just, it's all these probability like wave fields of potential and goodness that you're like looking at and wanting to see happen. And uh, yeah, it's just a super fun selection process. It's a, it's a freedom. It's a jazz. It's a art like that. You get to just kind of immerse yourself in the moment and figure out like, man, this should go here on this, and I just can't wait. And you're so excited about it. Like as soon as it happens, it's like, oh my god, I'm gonna crack these next year. And I want to make sure my friends grow these, and then you get to see it on other farms and places. And that's just so exciting to see something new and all kinds of amazing things come out of polyhybrids and it can be very you know different too so I, I like to really label the polyhybrids because there can be certain aspects that that 
come from the line breeding, so they can actually kind of be some relatively stable sometimes, and then other combinations will be all over the place, and it depends on those combinations going in. And so I like to kind of like be able to let people know a bit and guide like on what you know you might be experiencing with something. You know, there's three very select kind of things that come out of it, or there's a certain uniformity, or it's just all over the place. But um, yeah, I just I just love the the selection process and and um, really respect the the length of time to put each year into making a selection on that next generation, like to grow out several plants and to then continue on. That's a very useful thing. And um, you know, Nick, with the seeds that he's brought today, uh, a lot of people have some really useful breeding tools in their hand because now you actually have a line bred thing that you could put with another one to make true hi you know, uh, F1 hybrids that are going to have that vigor and uniformity that we expect in all agriculture. Thanks. <laughs> So yeah, keeping the uh, the diversity in the stock is important. Like uh, my dad always said, keeping more than just one one of the males around. At least keep keep a couple of them to, to breed on. You know, keeping the, the diversity in the stock. Um, it, you never know what you're gonna get out of those seeds. Then like, there might be one in there that's just like the one. Louder. <laughs> Um, poly hybrids, I, I like, uh, I, I breed, I bred the velvet perps down a, 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 like five or six generations, so it's pretty stable, and then um, definitely breeding them back on other varieties, and, you know, it, it just uh, shows the diversity of, you know, what we're working with, and uh, it's just really special, and I'm happy to do it. So. Poly hybrids, I say, are the best for people hunting clonal stock. <laughs> that was <laughs> yeah. Well edited. <laughs> what Nick said. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, what, no, but seriously, what Nick said, yeah, like, uh, for clone stock, yeah, that's kind of, yeah, because I've, yeah, this just depends on the direction you want to go, right, who, 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 you know, who your clients are, what your market is, so I mean, a lot of this really is depends on who, who your clients are and where, what your market is, so it's kind of like, but yeah, as far as poly hybrids, um, yeah, like if you're, which is kind of good because you you have your poly hybrid, you have you make a, an amazing selection, and then you clone, you're working that line there, and which you're gonna get some really nice diversity, and then you can just kind of work with that because you know there's a lot of ways to you know I don't know it just depends on I really feel like it depends on like what you're trying to do a lot of the times you know that just makes. Uh, that just d makes you know whatever you know you go in that direction so you know for me that's kind of like the poly hybrid thing is cool because i make a, a selection and and run that in my greenhouse in a in like a high yield in you know uh see a green style and that kind of works um then i get get what i'm looking for but but lately i mean i've just been kind of running with you know whatever different hype clones and and you know yeah, bullshit yeah, yeah. just because like the market dad. all right we got a lost dad give her the mic lost dad yeah, dad. Uh, yeah. Oh, lost dad. hey everybody um finn yeah. is looking for tucker okay. tucker 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 what's tucker's tucker last name? looking for you tucker tucker I'm sure he's around. I'm sure he's around here yeah. trying to find you. Okay, so he's not leaving without you, bud. We're gonna Agent stay Tucker. really close to this area. If anybody knows Tucker, what's Tucker's last name? Uh, Johnson. Johnson. Tucker Johnson from last name. from where? Uh, I don't know. 
Okay. They found Barberville? They yeah, found they awesome. Them. Look right here. Thank you very much. Gave you a good little time. Oh, yeah. Uh, you ready, Daniel? Sure, yeah. This is Dom General, everybody. It <laughs> Which, you know, with the price of inputs, you know, it seems like everyone's going to be headed that route, you know. I'm about to go get a truckload of mistletoe. I'm excited for the high phosphorus. <laughs> um, yeah, it's fun working the lines, and I, I like to grow for, like, production for, like, a commercial farm, like an F3 to F6, and I've seen some F3s that are really stable, and I've seen some F4s that aren't. Um, but stable, stable enough to blend, and you know, you, moon gazers here, they're you know, they're doing some smaller batch of stuff, which is also kind of like uh, it could be a niche market trend anyway. Like uh, I know, like smaller batches are easy to work with, and and we're gonna see what that's like when we're going some true F ones in a few years. You know, they're gonna see that's gonna be fun. You know, I have the velvet coffee I'm gonna be starting, which is, you know, not, you know, but two stable lines um, bred in together. I'm excited for that and. Um, I also breed a lot of auto flowers and back cross it, uh, into that with the photo periods and so we're getting the, here you go, what Nick said. <laughs> and I'm just going to just uh, repeat what Jesse said, I fucking love Holly, I Holly High. What Nick said. <laughs> <laughs> testing, testing. Uh, right. I just absolutely love Poly Hybrids too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, I didn't know about cloning them, but I just love to find them and breed them and then just kind of do the whole cycle again. We keep our males pretty close, like just far enough and downwind. So I love each every of each of our 600 plants to have like one seed in it. So if I find some pheno that I didn't breed, I can just, I'll plant that. And if it's a male, I'll use it. If it's a female, I'll definitely seed it up. That's it. Sweet, yeah. I'm like, if you're looking for hash, if you're looking for the best hash varieties, you gotta go find the poly hybrids and look at the back stock, the lineage in there, and all the stuff should be from other hash varieties too, so. So yeah, yay for poly hybrids. Uh, we should never like look down on that. Yay for inbred lines, we love them. Yay for the back crosses. We could get into that, and I have a whole my own kind of old way of back crossing. But back to, um, generation back to generation, even yeah. next generation. But anyway, <laughs> um, thanks, thanks for listening, you guys. We're gonna wrap it up. Thanks for, thanks for coming out, everybody. Dempier panel. So hunted. Uh, look for us at our booths. You know, we're hanging out. Come talk. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Feel the light.